Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the differences and similarities between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. So the first thing we need to look at, or I think, is we should focus on the skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscle is obviously gonna be muscle that's attached to our skeleton, and when it contracts, it allows for our body to move. So it's there predominantly for locomotion, for us to be able to do work, produce force. You can see a couple of things. First of all, that this is a single skeletal muscle cell. So the whole thing here is a muscle cell, which is sometimes also called a muscle fiber, which is sometimes also called a myocyte. They're all synonymous with one another, they mean the exact same thing. This is a muscle fiber, a muscle cell, a myocyte. Now, you can see a couple of things. First thing is, it has multiple nuclei, so more than one nuclei. And the reason why that's the case is because embryologically, when you were developing, different stem cells came together to form just a single muscle cell. That's why I have multiple nuclei. The other thing is that a single muscle cell has all these what we call myofibrils. So just that is a myofibril. Don't get confused. This is not a muscle cell. This whole thing here is a muscle cell. So this is a myofibril and you can see that inside the myofibril we have all these lines that I've drawn and they are proteins. They're actually filaments, so proteinaceous filaments, and these filaments inside, which we call microfilaments or myofilaments, I'll just write filaments, are made up of two kinds, right? So myosin, which is the thick filament, and actin, which is the thin filament, this one here. Now a couple other things that you can see is these filaments are lined up parallel to one another from one myofibril to the next myofibril. And you can see that the filaments are anchored to particular structural proteins. So for example, there's a structural, a line of structural proteins here that's called the M-line. And the reason why it's called the M-line, or sorry, I should say the way I remember it being called the N-line is you've got these three lines like that. I call it the M-line because it looks like an M. That's how I remember it. And this line here is called the Z-line. And the way I remember the Z-line is it looks squiggly like a Z. Now what these lines are, or the Z-disc and the M-line, are simply anchorage points for the thick and thin filaments. So for example, the M-line is anchoring the myosin and the Z-disc is anchoring the actin. So what we need to understand for this type of muscle cell, is that when it contracts, all that's happening is that the thick myosin filament binds to the actin and it pulls it in, right, like this. So the myosin actually has these little, what we call myosin heads, look like little golf clubs on them, right? And the actin, like this, needs the myosin heads to bind to it, and what, once it binds, it pulls it in. So once they bind, they pull it in. So what that means is one Z-disc to another Z-disc shorten. And in actual fact, from one Z-disc to another Z-disc, that's called a sarcomere. And the sarcomere is what we call the contractile subunit of skeletal muscle. And again, that's what shortens. And because skeletal muscle is aligned in parallel like this, it means that the muscle shortens in one particular direction. All right, that's important because let's just say the bicep, which we know the biceps have multiple muscle cells associated with it. When it contracts, it shortens and because it's attached from one bone to another bone, it moves that bone. That's the whole point of the skeletal muscle. All right, so we've got the skeletal muscle there. Let's compare that to the smooth muscle, then look at the innervation. So how does the nervous system affect it? First thing, smooth muscle is not shaped like a cylinder, like skeletal muscle is. It's shaped more like an eye, it's tapered on either end, first point. Second point is it also contains these filaments and the filaments are myosin, thick, actin, thin, but you can see they're not arranged in parallel like it is for the skeletal muscle. And here's an amazing thing, right? With the skeletal muscle, where those myosin thick filaments are, if you look at it under a microscope, they're dark banded areas. So it looks like there's stripes 
on skeletal muscle. And that's what we call striations. This is why skeletal muscle is termed as being striated. All right? Smooth muscle, because the way that the filaments are arranged are not in parallel, there's no striations, and that's why it's actually called smooth muscle, because there is no striations. So it's not striated. You can also see that one smooth muscle cell has a single nuclei as well. So it's shaped differently, the nuclei number are different, and the arrangement of the filaments are different. Next thing, but it's still actinomycin, right? And they still have myosin heads that need to bind to the actin. Next thing is that the filaments are actually not bound to these M lines and Z discs, for example. They're actually bound to these structures here called dense bodies which are protein-based structures, right? Dense bodies. And you can see the dense bodies are actually attached to one another through more proteins, more cytostructural proteins. And these ones here, like that one for example, is called an intermediate filament. And the great thing about this intermediate filament is it connects one dense body to the next. I'll show you why in a sec. All right, so when we stimulate this muscle to contract, same thing, myosin heads bind to the actin and it pulls it across, shortening it. But it shortens in that direction, that direction, that direction, that direction, that direction. Plus, when it shortens, the dense body moves. If the dense body moves, the intermediate filament moves and the whole muscle moves and it gets basically balled up. It scrunches up, and that's what happens with smooth muscle. Now, why? I said skeletal muscle is attached to the skeleton. Smooth muscle, we find lining hollow organs. Now, think about that, lining hollow organs. So, the types of organs you're going to find with smooth muscle is going to include the whole gastrointestinal tract. Esophagus, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, rectum, colon, all this type of stuff. It's going to be genitourinary, right? So the reproductive tract and the urinary tract as well. Blood vessels, right? All of these structures have smooth muscle in it. The other thing you should notice here is that we do not consciously control the contraction or relaxation of the smooth muscles in this area, but we do control it for skeletal muscle. So this is nervous system wise controlled consciously. This one is controlled unconsciously, or this is voluntary contraction, this is involuntary contraction. So now what we can do is talk about the innovation to it. So we can talk about if we know that one's voluntary and one's involuntary, we can sort of deduce what parts of the nervous system are going to be involved in it. Now, with the skeletal muscle, this will be pretty easy because it's muscle, it's conscious, it's attached to the bones, it's going to be motor neurons. Right? And there's two motor neurons that go from the cortex down to the skeletal muscle that needs to contract. So if I were to draw up a spinal cord, and then I was going to draw up the grey matter associated with the spinal cord, and then I'm going to draw up the spinal nerves, go into a mixed nerve, right? And that's obviously on the other side. We all know that sensory input goes through the dorsal nerve root, and motor output comes through the ventral nerve root. All right. We also know that the cell body for the lower motor neuron, the upper motor neuron from the brain down at the spinal cord, the lower motor neuron is going to be, this is where the cell body is, in the ventral grey horn, and it leaves through the ventral nerve root and it comes out. Now here's an amazing thing, right? This motor neuron, this motor neuron is going to synapse with this skeletal muscle. But it's going to have multiple branches with multiple synapses. And what you're going to find is that it will synapse, one single motor neuron will synapse with a number of myocytes or muscle fibers or muscle cells. It's all the same thing. And again, think about this. So each muscle cell needs its own individual innovation, but you can have multiple muscle cells innovated by the same motor neuron. When we collect all these skeletal muscle cells innovated by the same motor neuron, we call that a motor unit. So when we talk about motor unit recruitment, this is what we're referring to. But you can have more than one motor neuron innovating one muscle group. So the biceps, for example, it's not just going to be one motor neuron. It's going to be more motor neurons, but 
one motor neuron may innervate multiple muscle cells. And what's gonna happen? We've spoken about the neuromuscular junction. Sends an impulse and action potential down, releases calcium. Calcium triggers acetylcholine to be released. Acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors. That causes more depolarization by sodium jumping in, which causes calcium release throughout the whole muscle and it contracts through the actin and myosin cross bridges occurring. Smooth muscle, let's have a look. We can draw a spinal cord. Same thing. And we know it's autonomic. And an autonomic division of the motor division of the nervous system is gonna be the sympathetic parasympathetic divisions. So we can draw the same thing up. Right, now here's the other thing that the cell body for the autonomic nervous system is going to be in the middle of my hand. And it's going to exit. And because it's autonomic nervous system, which is a two neuron chain from the spinal cord, it's going to synapse at a ganglia. Whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, doesn't matter. And this is going to go down and innervate the muscle cell. Now, if this is in the stomach, intestines and it's smooth muscle and we want to tell that smooth muscle to contract it's going to be part of the parasympathetic division right parasympathetic nervous system and acetylcholine will be released here and acetylcholine will be released here and acetylcholine stimulates smooth muscle to contract acetylcholine stimulates skeletal muscle to contract that's another similarity but here's a big difference when we look at smooth muscle and we draw its arrangement we know it lines hollow organs. That's a really important point. It lines hollow organs. So, if I were to draw up a tube like this, and let's say it's the intestines, you're gonna find, for example, smooth muscle arranged around the tube, like that, and along the length of the tube. You've actually got multiple different arrangements of smooth muscle in the intestines. This is called circular smooth muscle, and this is called longitudinal. And the whole point of smooth muscle in the gastrointestinal tract, for example, or genitourinary tract, for example, is you want to narrow the diameter of the tube and shorten the length of the tube because this pushes things through. Right? This is called peristalsis. So the smooth muscle aids in peristalsis in this process. All right, here's the other thing. This muscle layer, called the muscularis, right, between the circular and the longitudinal, right, I'm going to draw it up. You have a red plexus, that's a, called the myenteric plexus, right? So let's just say we've got, let's draw it like this. Smooth muscle like that. All right. And let's just say this is smooth muscle in a hollow tube, like the intestines, for example. You got the neuron coming down. It's gonna synapse. And there's gonna be all these ganglia, which is part of the myenteric plexus. Right, here's the thing. Let's just say there's a bit of food. So let's just say this is part of a hollow tube, right? Let's just say, a bit of food or chyme or whatever it may be is moving through. What it does is it stretches the hollow inside of this tube. When it stretches it, it stimulates the muscle and stimulates the associated neurons. Now what happens is amazing. The neurons behind this tube, right, it releases neurotransmitters to tell the muscle to contract. And the types of neurotransmitters that tell muscle, smooth muscle to contract is acetylcholine and substance P two important ones. But because smooth muscle, I didn't say this, they're connected through these gap junctions. One smooth muscle talks to the next smooth muscle by propagating the action potential. That's very different to skeletal muscle, right? Where an individual cell must be innervated. You only need to innervate one and it sends the signal through. That's called a syncytium. So if I were to tell this muscle to contract, it's going to tell the rest of them to contract. That food's not moving through if that happens. So what we need to do is tell a signal in front of the food to relax. Behind, contract, in front, relax. So there needs to be more neurons sending signals down. And the neurotransmitters to tell it to relax include nitric oxide and VIP, 
right? Vasoactive intestinal protein, nitric oxide and vasoactive intestinal protein, no VIP, right? They're two neurotransmitters or chemicals that are released. They relax smooth muscle. So what amazingly happens is behind the food it contracts, in front of the food it dilates and that pushes the food through, that's peristalsis. When it gets to the next part, it does the same thing, stretches, stimulates behind to contract and in front to relax. That's amazing and that is one of the big differences between smooth and skeletal. Here's another difference. Calcium is required for both, right? You need calcium, but here's the difference. Calcium here comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which are basically these networks. It's the endoplasmic reticulum for skeletal muscle. And so that's where calcium comes from for skeletal muscle to contract. Remember, calcium is the key that unlocks the actin and myosin to contract. For smooth muscle, calcium comes from endoplasmic reticulum, but also comes in from outside the cell, right? And again, calcium is required to tell smooth muscle to contract. But for smooth muscle, you need one more thing, something called calmodulin. And calmodulin is actually found inside the muscle cell. So when calcium comes into the muscle cell or is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it binds the calmodulin and then allows for the actinomycin to bind and contract. So there's a quick run through of the differences between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. Hopefully that helps.